Okay, and good evening. Hello everyone from Avid Reader, um, broadcasting live. Um, this is Bianca and um, I'd like to um, just thank you all so much for joining us this evening. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I am currently broadcasting to you from, the Yagara and Turrbal people. I pay my respects to elders past and present and emerging and acknowledge that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. I'm so pleased to be here with you tonight for this discussion of A Secret Australia, revealed by the WikiLeaks as exposés with um, Peter Crono, uh, Paul Barrett and moderator Annette Brownlee. And I'll be introducing our special guest just in a moment. Um, so while, um, because we're on a um, online format tonight, there's just a little bit of housekeeping I'll go through. Um, so before I hand over to our speakers, um, I'll quickly re reiterate some of the information you were passed on in the email. Um, you've all been automatically placed on mute and will remain so throughout the event. Um, but our speakers are very keen to answer your questions towards the end of the event. So if there's time, um, please start sending them through as you think of them in the chat box. And I'll be sending um, some information and reminders your way th um, through that chat as well. Um, so, and I'll also be sharing a link to where you can purchase your copies of A Secret Australia in just a moment. Okay, so that chat box will just simply pop up on the screen when that happens. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to now introduce our special guest speakers for the evening. Paul Barrett is a former Secretary, Department of Defence, and is President of Australians for War Powers Reform. Peter Crono is an investigative journalist and longtime producer for ABC TV's Four Corners. He has won numerous journalism awards, including the Gold Walkley, for a joint report on the political violence in East Timor in 2006. He has also reported for ABC Radio's background briefing, most recently with the groundbra groundbreaking report, Pine Gap's Role in US War Fighting. His forthcoming book is titled The Base, Australia's Secret Role in America's Global Wars. Annette Brownlee is on the committee of Brisbane-based Just Peace Queensland, which was of the, one of the founding organizations of the Independent and Peaceful Australia Network. Um, or IPAN. In 2012, um, IPAN represents organisations and individuals across the country aiming to build public dialogue and pressure for change to a truly independent foreign policy for Australia, one in which our government plays a positive role in solving international conflicts peacefully. Annette serves as the chairperson of IPAN. So Annette, it's now my pleasure to hand things over to you as our moderator and MC this evening. Thank you. Thanks very much, Bianca. That was a lovely introduction. And um, welcome to everybody who's uh, come along to learn more about the book that um, Peter Crono and Felicity Ruby have put together. And I congratulate both Peter and Felicity on the work that they've done in this very important um, window into um, the ramifications, I suppose, for us in Australia about the role that WikiLeaks has played. Um, now I'm going to start the evening off with hearing from Peter and then from Paul. But first of all, from Peter, I'd like you to give um, some background. I'd be happy to give you some background. And uh, sorry, there's some interference at all. Yeah, just some, some background into what motivated you and Felicity to put this book together. Yeah, well, look, um, a couple of years ago, I attended a, a small conference at the ABC that, um, that Flick was involved in putting together. And it, it was discussing surveillance and secrecy and issues of, of doing investigative journalism for journalists. And the best way to, to use encryption and other means to... Um, to make sure we can do our work. And, um, and we had a great journalist attend, Nikki Hager from New Zealand, who's a terrific mm -hmm. journalist. And uh, he gave us some tips and, and it was a very positive meeting afterwards, um, got together with Flick. We sort of did a bit of a look back on what happened and, and we were both bemoaning how WikiLeaks had kind of evaporated 
in terms of uh, being in the current uh, mindset. So we thought that uh, there, there needs to be uh, a reminder of what it was about. There was far too much focus on the messenger, on Julian Assange and, and whatever quirks people might be able to find with his personality or even, even more, and, and most of it's just a load of rubbish. But uh, the media happily uh, focused on that, including our ABC. And, but I decided there needed to be a look at the, uh, the, the message. What was WikiLeaks telling us about Australia? Flick had, had exactly the same idea. We talked about the best way of doing it and a book seemed to be the way of doing it rather than us try to construct the single tome from on high. We, we thought it was better if we approached a whole bunch of people with good minds um, who you know, could, could lend their point of view about what WikiLeaks had done for Australia, what we actually learned about Australia by WikiLeaks doing its work. And um, so we approached, you know, initially a dozen and, you know, uh, I think it turned out to be 18 in total. And uh, we, we've got journalists and academics and former departmental secretaries. We've got uh, a psychologist, we've, we've got all sorts of people and, um, and they bring very unique perspectives uh, to what WikiLeaks is about, what it's done for Australia what we've learned about ourselves. And, uh, and, and the salutary lesson of it is that it is so too easy to be distracted from the message by kerfuffle about the messenger. I mean, it, there has been an effort to, to remove the WikiLeaks stories and discussions from the narrative in Australia to, to marginalize it. And, um, and you know, hopefully the book has helped to bring some of the issues that WikiLeaks has brought up back onto the stage. Well, I certainly learned a lot reading it, uh, Peter, and we might touch on quite a few of those things as part of the discussion tonight. And um, Paul, just what motivated you to contribute to the book? Um, you've certainly, um, your contribution I think was quite unique, um, given your legal background. Um, so, would you like to speak to that? Yeah, thanks, Annette. <clears throat> I think this whole issue sat at, uh, sat at the intersection of two or three important baskets of issues for me. Uh, just going back to uh, where I started my career in the public service, which was uh, as a sort of freshly hatched, hatched science graduate working with uh, very sensitive material as a defence analyst, as an intelligence analyst and, uh, and these days we don't have to be secretive about it was looking at the then very new Chinese nuclear program and what can we find out about that. Um, in, in that environment I was brought up in to regard uh, national security classification very strictly uh, because there are definitions of what constitutes top secret or secret or confidential or for government use only with the lowest classification. And it's emphasized on it never to overclassify documents. Uh, because if you if you get in the habit of classifying everything as, as secret or top secret, then you degrade the whole currency and you don't know what's really secret and what's not. And I think you can see that in the attitude to cabinet documents. Everything's secret, and therefore any uh, uh, political minder feels free to leak the bits that they think aren't all that secret, and will help their boss or something like it. So there's that, there's that that basket of issues. Uh, but when when things like uh, WikiLeaks came along, I start wondering what are the limits. Uh, having been brought up in that environment where you must never disclose something as your duty not to disclose, what are the limits of your duty not to disclose? And uh, it's very clear that you can't have a legal limit to conceal a crime. You, you can't have a, a legal obligation to conceal a crime. Uh, and I very much doubt that you've got a legal obligation to conceal m misleading uh, behaviour that, 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 that can't, uh, information that can't be uh, uh, justified on strict national security grounds. 
And it's worth remembering that in 1978, Malcolm Fraser introduced freedom of information legislation, which meant as a matter of law, it was no longer permissible to uh, withhold information on the ground that it was embarrassing to the government, which was permissible prior to that. But now, uh, it, it, unless there's a good national security reason for it, you can't do it. Uh, so I, I won't unpack that any further, but the third issue is the basket of human rights issues. And I've been involved in two or three cases where a couple of us have written letters to the foreign minister and taken him or her to task for failing to stand up for Australian citizens. And they'll, they'll always retreat back to, oh, we can't intervene in the legal process of another country, et cetera, et cetera. We have treaty level obligations, but the whole network of countries that have treaty level obligations about the quality of the legal processes uh, to which anybody in that jurisdiction would be subjected. And I would think that uh, uh, the processes to which Julian's being subjected at the moment would defy any uh, definition of a fair trial. Uh, and, and our government should be jumping up and down uh, about ensuring that that uh, Julian Assange is, is being properly treated. So those two or three cross-cutting sets of issues come to uh, come together in my head. And then uh, with my uh, war powers reform hat on, I also uh, am fascinated to find out what's going on behind the scenes uh, between us and countries to whom we're close. Well, it's interesting because the, the, the word that really leaped out at me repeatedly reading the book was um, loyalty. And um, what do you think, Peter, the, this sense of loyalty to the United States, to the club that Australia is part of, the Five Eyes, but really more with the United States? Would you like to uh, kind of extrapolate? Yeah, look, the, there's nothing wrong with being loyal to friends. And I think that's that's a good basis for um, for a relationship between friends or between friendly countries. But friends need to be able to be honest to each other. There's no point, well, leading a, a friend along the path or keeping your criticisms of the bad things they're doing to yourself. A country has to be able to speak up for itself and have its own standards and opinions and values and to be able to state them. Unfortunately, Australia is way too timid uh, in that relationship and a lot of things uh, get through to the keeper as a result that probably oughtn't happen. I mean, the main one is probably that, that we say yes whenever we're asked, we're asked to join an American war, you know, whether it be the first Gulf War or Iraq or Afghanistan, we way too readily jump in. It would have been a hell of a lot better if, uh, as, as we know, if, if if you read closely in the media, that Osama bin Laden was was offered to be to be put on trial. Um, the Taliban offered to hand him over to a third country, and we could have avoided the entire Afghan war, the twenty years of pain and death and destruction that's been wrought upon that country. Uh, uh, bin Laden and his Al Qaeda leaders were offered to be handed over for a trial. Now, there would have been all sorts of problems. There's all sorts of reasons to be, you know, critical of an offer like that. And, but the thing is, you've got to grasp at peace and grab it and make use of it because the alternative is to horrendous. Look what it does to our young men. It throws them into a, a, a situation where war crimes pop out. In, and, and when that happens, loyal journalists need to be able to criticise Australia without being seen as being un-Australian. And therefore, the WikiLeaks venture has provided a whole bunch of tools. It's got journalists on their toes in terms of a terrific, terrific example. I mean, clearly the, the gunning down of civilians from a helicopter video, the release of that to the public was enormously valuable in terms of ramming home what war is about. Wars was about stamping people out. It's about destruction and killing. And, and even when journalists are being killed and filmed and verified, the Americans hadn't 
owned up to that. They hadn't agreed that that had happened in that way. And only through the leak did the truth happen. Now, no one's been prosecuted for it, but the public is now seeing what war is really like. It's, it's not a kindergarten. And any suggestion that it's all brass bands and streamers down at the wharf is one that's been brought to us by the PR merchants. It's not the reality. WikiLeaks has helped bring us uh, a bit more reality. In the fine tradition of people like John Pilger and, and others who over the years have, uh, have dug into those darker corners. So in terms of loyalty, look, there's a lot of loyal journalists at the ABC. Some have been threatened with jail. By, by the Australian Federal Police. And uh, fortunately, you know, just in the last part of last year, the, the charges against one ABC journalist were not proceeded with. They were being considered by the DPP. An extraordinary state of affairs, especially when the, the, the fact of those crimes is now extremely apparent. And the question remains, Without a leak and without the journalists to, to do it, would there have been enough pressure on government to do an investigation? So WikiLeaks is part of that tradition of getting information that, that governments generally don't like and getting it out to, to the public. But it, it does that in, in a way that um, has been described as scientific journalism, which is about rather than just quoting a couple of sentences from a document, what WikiLeaks does and insists in, with its uh, publication partners is that the entire document gets published. The entire document from front page to back page, hundreds of pages, whatever it may be, so that the selectivity of a journalist can be examined. The, the potential biases can be examined. The reasons a journalist has picked uh, a sentence or two out of a, a secret report can be understood as well as further gems uh, in those documents can be found. I'm still finding gems in the WikiLeaks archive. There are some amazing things still unpublished in the WikiLeaks archive. And I, I would commend people to pop a name or an incident or something into the search engine and just spend a couple of hours flicking through the documents and information you can find. It is mind boggling some of the things you'll find. So. So look, um, a whole bunch of tools have also been given uh, to the world by WikiLeaks. And, um, and um, you know, that, that's that ability to cooperate globally and do these massive uh, global uh, documentation of events, you know, working with Guardian, New York Times, Washington Post, and dragging them over the line to, to publish information that critiques um, powerful governments, the US government and, and its actions and the actions of other, other, other countries such as Australia. So the overall pressure from WikiLeaks to do these things has been a very big positive, although lots of people may not want to admit it. But it's also told us particular facts about Australia that we were not all so aware of. And um, as a result of that, uh, people have begun to, people have suspected things for a long time, for example, for a long, long time, people suspected, gee, there must be people in the main political parties that leak information to the American government. I wonder if that really happens. And there's been books written about the, the 75 dismissal of Gough Whitlam and were there whistleblowers in his cabinet? And, and now we know that that's precisely a task of the US Embassy in Canberra. And that is to approach members of Australian political parties and get information about uh, up and coming uh, potential leaders of political parties, about the ins and outs of the factions. Uh, we learned that through WikiLeaks alone and the documents named the people who were the sources for that information. It was, it was embarrassing to them. And, and the documents showed that their names were to be protected. So they were secret sources inside the Labor Party, but also the Liberal Party, also in industry, people who were providing information to the US government for purposes of ensuring good relations in their mind, um, personal advancement. But- Well, I'll give you a very sinister example, Peter. Yeah. Um, the WikiLeaks documents show about about the ones relating to Australia show that 
about 10 minute, 10 months before Kevin Rudd uh, w w was dragged down. Mark Arbib was preparing the, the, the US Embassy for a Gillard Prime Ministership. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yep. And saying that you, know, you shouldn't worry about the fact that she's from the left, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and what, the, what, that, what that reveals absolute, with absolute crystal clarity is that Rudd was never meant to win. Mm. He was meant to get the Labor Party close that time round. Uh, but he wasn't a sort of insider, uh, yeah. so his his win was a bit of a problem. And within months of his win, uh, the move was was being prepared against him. To, and part of that was to prepare the universe, the, the U.S. embassy mm. for it. And it's all yeah. there in 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 WikiLeaks. And of course, um, any embassy anywhere in the world, it, it, part of doing its job is to find out as much as it can about the country it's going on in. Yep. What you have to criticise is the people who, who volunteer themselves as inside sources uh, for a foreign embassy. Yep. And, and uh, the question is, why would they want to know the foibles of a potential leader? Why would yeah. they want to know the weaknesses and, you know, for what well, purpose would they put it? All sorts of reasons about that, but why would people want to reveal them? Yeah. Um, Whose side are you actually on? If we yeah. could go back to the five hour eyes for a moment, Annette. Yeah. It needs to be understood that the five eyes arrangement is something that arose in the immediate post-war period. So it was a Cold War thing. Uh, and with the rough, much more limited technologies a day, it was about dividing the globe up with an agreement that we would share the intelligence. So we'll concentrate on certain parts of the of, of the, the world and we'll share the intelligence that we can gather and glean from our respective areas. Uh, so, for example, we would have much more focus on Indonesia than the Americans would, uh, and we would tell them what we'd found out of what we thought. But it is no more and no less than an intelligence sharing arrangement. Hey, fellas, we found out this. You actually you share uh, the raw data, and your respective intelligence agencies make of it what they can. Mm. Uh, and there is no implied uh, undertaking to take any course of action as a result. We, we, just, we just day in day out. There's, a, there's an exchange of intelligence. We've We've read this person's mail. We've overheard this telephone conversation. Um, here's a dump of our latest take. And uh, th th there are no obligations arising from it about uh, supporting any particular uh, geopolitical position or joining in any war. It is just an intelligence sharing arrangement. Mm. Yep. Yeah. And that, that, um, that intelligence sharing has been put on steroids with digital technology. You know, once when it was film strips having to be parachuted down from a satellite to be picked up and looked at one by one, those days are so far gone. Wiretaps well, have too. Uh, um, both, both, I mean, every, both imagery every, and, and yeah. Uh, audio. Yeah, and, and everything is kept now. So it provides a massive database through which to to comb for whatever particular detail um, you want. And, and therefore, because it is so intrusive, there, there does need to be pretty good controls over it because um, um, great power, um, it, it provides a great temptation. And that's why, that's, that's why the WikiLeaks project has been so attacked and unsupported by the Australian government. On the surface, it's investigative journalism telling us things we need to know. But what it's done is threatened the powerful to such an extent that they've decided to make Assange a, an outcast uh, and have done it in such a disgusting way uh, and pushed him to the point, to the brink of his own life. And we can't even get a peep out of our own government to complain about it to, or to advocate for him. We're advocating for a Russian uh, opposition leader who's been mistreated recently, we're not advocating for an Australian journalist in high security in London who's facing charges of doing journalism. Um, and why uh, is he in high security? Oh, well, really, I mean, 
Paul, I think we know that the aim is to, well, a double aim, one is to break him well and truly, but the, but the other one is to show to any other smart aleck journos out there that if they had to think even twice about doing the sort of thing that Julian Assange does, they'll be ground up and thrown in a high security uh, jail. It, it's one thing to do a story like the ABC did about the Afghan war, war and, and things that happened. But what WikiLeaks has done is done, done stories and provided information about every aspect of, of Australian life, about just about every country in the world, maybe, you know, I mean, including Russia, believe it or not. And it has become a vast uh, uh, national archive or international archive to rival national archives of individual governments. And it's free and it's always available 24 hours. So it, it's a challenge that people don't like. The Australian National Archive uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't release a lot of information. It holds back information as we've seen with the palace letters. And the only reason they've been held back is because it reveals what things were done in secret um, uh, behind the public's back to interfere in what our, we think our democracy is. Mm -hmm. Our democracy is, is a very thin beast and it needs feeding. It doesn't need subverting. And uh, without, without knowledge, the public will vote on a whim or for other reasons or for the, uh, for the wallet or whatever. But, um, but if people understand the things that are being done, good or bad, then they're better informed. So just in principle, the WikiLeaks project is about supporting democracy. And that's why it's been the target of Western, powerful Western agencies. And openness. And I think makes me think about the whole, um, uh, you know, ridiculous situation of uh, investigating foreign interference when what we see with the WikiLeaks um, cables and so on is is you know overt foreign interference um, usually from the United States uh, but that's the country that's not identified as being a country of concern interfering in Australia's affairs um, yeah. Yeah. yeah well um, and, and it goes you know I would love to get the WikiLeaks dump for for the dates since uh, since all those State Department documents fell into their hands. I'd love to know what's been happening over the years since. I'd love to be able to do a database search of those State Department documents because the US Embassy is still interfering in Australian politics. It's doing it to this day. Um, it yeah. was published in the Sydney Morning Herald last year how the US Embassy leaked a fake dossier, well, a, a fudged dossier of so-called intelligence to, to the Murdoch press uh, to help put pressure on, uh, on our government, on our prime minister to come out stronger against China. Um, that, that's, th th this should be the substance of royal commissions. And, and these things are happening far too regularly because it's our friends, we seemingly accept it. But if they're good friends, they would accept the criticism and they would accept occasionally the word no. Um, but, but you see what happens to journalists. They're not, they're not the favourite um, uh, uh, profession and, uh, of, of the powerful. They're, they're seen as biased. The attack, the attack on the ABC is unrelenting and, and it's going to continue until the ABC is dead. And I think unless people see it, and the WikiLeaks uh, archive gives you a glimpse of the powerful things that are being done behind our back. Unless people really stand up and take action, not just tweeting occasionally, but really we've got to, we've got to walk through the door and get out there and do something. If we don't, our democracy is going to get weaker and weaker. The, you know, don't get me started on the surveillance laws. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll see what's happening to uh, David McBride, the um, again the mes messenger has been targeted over the afghan files and he's still you know in the process of being charged with that uh, leak that he um yeah. yeah well it's it's the example you know it's the it, it's the principle of destroying one person to set the example to all the others and um i can tell you that you know the abc raids the day after the abc raids i'm aware of um 
uh, a very revealing interview that was cancelled, not by, I wouldn't call them a whistleblower, but they were a person who was going to appear on national television and they were, they were chill, you know, the chilling effect had chilled them and they withdrew. So this, this idea of intimidating the media works on all sides. So that's why the book kind of says, oh, bugger it, you know, let's just look at what, what we know about Australia through WikiLeaks. Let's not be timid. Let's get out there and see what's going on. And there's a there's a continuum of of power being abused. Um, you know, some of the some of our writers in in the book have um, have um, drawn it back to the Whitlam government and the subversion that took place to to overthrow the Whitlam government. Um, uh, and it's uh, you know WikiLeaks is described as being in the tradition of of uh, of that the larrikin Australian taking a step forward trying to do what's best for Australia and, and copying it as a result. Yeah, that was a very interesting um, contribution from Guy Rundle. Yeah, I, I really appreciated reading that as well as many of the others. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I'd like yeah. to pick up on some of <laughs> different um, contributors and just That's different right. aspects of, you know, what they brought to the book. Well, Clinton Fernandez has written about uh, the commercial imperative that the U.S. Embassy has in all of its actions in Australia, yeah. that it's it's here not to organise folk dancing festivals, but it's it's here to ensure the the smooth running of um, U.S. companies and, and U.S. business through Australia. You know, we we all think that you know BHP and Rio Tinto and all these major Australia's major companies uh, are Australian owned, but they're not. Um, you know, I think of the top 20 Australian, uh, uh, the top 20 ASX co companies in Australia, I think 18 of them are foreign owned. Um, so, yep, there, there, there's a drastic need to understand what our relations with other countries are really all about. I haven't seen a folk, folk dancing festival, but I'm sure, um, I'm sure the US Embassy might like to organise one. I, I, I would definitely turn up. But, uh, but the Clinton Fernandez chapter um, analyzes that in, in terrific depth and, uh, and draws it out. And, and, mean, you know, and, and then another person is, is Quentin Dempster, who talks about how it's really the example that Assange has provided has, has given a, a new focus to a new generation of journalists reporting on defense and national security issues in Australia. You know, it's, it's I mean, the, exam, the models I had as a younger journo were people like Pilger, John Pilger and his book, A Secret Country, and Chomsky's work on how the media filters, uh, filters information out, filters the truth, uh, manufacturing dissent. But that's long, long gone. And, uh, and Assange is, is the new hero. That's why he's such a risk. Yeah, Lisa Johnson's um, contribution too, I thought was really informative about Australia's responsibilities being a, um, a signatory to the UN Convention on Torture and just not you know, failing to act to, um, to, you know, to support Julian Assange, who has been deemed to have been tortured as a result of an you know, assessment of the UN rapporteur, Hans Nelson. So, you know, again, I think it comes back to, you know, unfortunately, this loyalty to the, uh, uh, the United States, to the, the club of the Anglosphere, which is really, when you think about the Five Eyes, um, they're all white English speaking countries, um, seems to override the um, responsibility to protect one of your own citizens. Well, that's... That's the fibre of, of the person then, isn't it really? That, that, that tells you a lot about um, what the nature of, of, of people. I mean, are we, are we here to respond to pressure and power? Or are we here to create a good, worthwhile, comfortable, just democratic lifestyle here in Australia and then try to spread whatever help we can around the world? Or are we just a vassal state of the old British Empire in new colours with a new flag? Right. Oh, I mean, the, comments the, at this stage. <laughs> well, the 26th of January, what happens on that day will give you a hint of what I think the answer is. <laughs> well, and one of the thing, other things 
relevant this part of the conversation it's struck me by the revelations in the cables is just how pathetically craving of the approval of our friends we are to the point where we're quite incautious and really give hostages to fortune so Kim Beasley tells the Americans that we'll be alongside you in Afghanistan until hell freezes over so we've immediately forsworn any ability to uh, uh, react if they stuff up or if we think that there is uh, the, the war is heading in a direction that we can't support, etc. Because we've already said we're, we're, we're with you till hell freezes over. <laughs> and we say the same to Israel. Everybody who comes to a high office in Australia says to Israel, we're with you through thick and thin. Doesn't matter what you do. Go and bomb the hell out of the people in Gaza. Doesn't matter. We'll be on your side. So you see an Israeli ambassador surprised at how supportive Julia Gillard is of the Israeli assault on Gaza. Mm. He expected you have to sort of calm us down a bit, but oh no, go for it, you know? We're on your side. Mm. We're, we're, and yet we have, we, have, we have this pretense that we're even handed about the Middle East and we want to see a just peace, a two state solution, which died on a date you could choose somewhere in 1948, but certainly on a date in 1948. Incredible. Yeah, we're with you through thick and thin. Why would anybody looking after the interests of a particular sovereign state give a priori agreement to anything that, that another country, however friendly, would do? Mm. Just keep your powder dry. Mm. Yeah. Retain your ability to say, hey, hey, we didn't sign up for that. Or oh, we, we, we don't agree with that, or we're not going there, but we just can't do it. Paul, Paul can I ask you what, why you think that is? Why can't we? It's some sort of like lack of, it's a cringe, it's some sort of lack of national self confidence. Uh, we, we, we've, we, we've, we've got to have, you know, the, the great curtain shift from Britain to to the US during the, the Pacific War for entirely understandable reasons at that time, uh, but we've never grown yep. out of it. Yep. Uh, and we've never contemplated uh, the thought of having something that looks like an independent foreign policy uh, and, and something that uh, would sit in a more ne neutral position. Why, why are we an automatic supporter of US imperialism? The US has got bases in just about every bloody country in the world, except it's outright antagonists, mm -hmm. uh, and it's probably got special <laughs> forces in them. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, we just go along for the ride. I was just, um, and, and we don't know what's happening um, behind the, that curtain. Um, I was talking to someone about the, the ABC closed its bureau in, in Africa. And it's, and it's quite controversial yeah. inside the corporation and um, a lot of people are upset. But um, so I just had a quick look just to sort of see what's going on in Africa, because just to refresh myself, 29 military bases run by the United States in Africa. What are they doing? Hmm. What's their aim? What those, will be the four, they'll be, those will be the four more military bases. Be, yeah, but, they'll be the large ones. Yeah. But, 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 but there'll be the special forces who are operating covertly. <clears throat> Also in those countries, sometimes. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, and um, uh, but it, but in in other countries where they're undeclared. Well, Richard Tanter did a great chapter in the book, and it's it's one of, one of my favourites because it, it touches upon uh, how US uh, develops bases, and those bases have influence that go much wider than the barbed wire fence or the razor wire fence. On those bases, it, it's not just the fact that that we are helping direct drones to kill civilians in foreign countries. I mean, we're doing that. That's a fact. It's black and white. It's it's on documents. Look them up. Google it. But but the influence steps through the fence, and um, and and that is well. And the Americans are aware of that in in because they enforce a no uniforms policy in Alice Springs. So all the Pine Gaps uh, officers. And people who, who are working at Pine Gap are not allowed to wear their uniforms. 
uh, in, the, in, in downtown Alice Springs when they're out doing the shopping as a PR exercise to, to not you know, ups, upset people, not to have people think about it. But, um, but if, if horrendous things are happening from our soil, is knowing about it a problem? Um, is wanting to do something about it a problem? Should our parliaments be doing something about it? Well, nothing can be done about it if we don't have the information. Um, Malcolm, Malcolm Fraser raised that issue in his book, Dangerous <laughs> Allies. Yeah. And he, yeah. He, he reported on, he commented on the extent to which uh, the, the role of Pine Gap had changed with the change, with changes in technology. So mm. uh, a lot of those installations out there are initially about uh, detecting missile launches. Yep. Uh, and I, I, I love Richard's writing because I can quote him uh, and, and be sure that I won't inadvertently say something I shouldn't. I just, <laughs> make sure I, I just quote Richard Tander says this. But yeah, Malcolm, yeah. the point Malcolm puts two points together. One, we claim, pursuant to the agreement about Pine Gap, that we have full knowledge and consent of everything that happens at Pine Gap. And yet we know that uh, Pine Gap kills citizens of countries with whom we are not at war. Yep, yep, it does, it uh, does. And it's in, it's, uh, I mean, I, honestly, I, I find it beguiled, but just bewildering that, um, that Australians are not more interested in it because um, I think there seems to be a seduction of media and the Twitterverse and all sorts of things that are going on that have sucked the human brains towards other, uh, other aspects of the world. I mean, how much do we know about American politics and Trump now? I mean, every second story in our news yeah. programs are about American politics. Well, I want I to hear about us. I think a lot of that's driven by the... Um, the circus. Partly by, partly by Rupert, but also partly by the um, declining fortunes of mainstream media. Mm. So uh, um, it, it basically concentrate on sport and celebrities and to make yourself look like a serious newspaper, have a lot of stuff cut and pasted from the New York Times or, uh, or, or the Washington Post, wow. but, but very yeah. little original content about stuff that is of interest to Australians. Well, look, look there are some real renegade Australians trying to, to do, you know, in the spirit of WikiLeaks, get information out there that are, that's not in the mainstream. And, and a couple come to mind, you'd, you'd know them well, Paul, and that's um, Michael West Media. Um, which, yep. which is a, a website people should go and Google straight after this, um, yep, sure. this chat tonight. And, um, and uh, what's it, Pearls and Irritations? Irritations, yeah. yeah. Um, I might just come in at this point, Paul, Peter, um, mm. and Paul, just because it just seems the right moment to talk about what IPAN is, uh, uh, has set out to do, and that is to engage in a conversation with as broadly as, as many people from as many different parts of the world that we live in in Australia um, to, to get their views registered in a national inquiry into the costs and consequences of Australia's involvement in US-led wars and the alliance. And we're asking people to not only share their concerns and views about what's our, our history with the, uh, the in, within that relationship, but also to um, project alternatives that they might have, alternatives for the future that people might like to share. And we hope that this is going to form a substantial uh, expose of ordinary citizens around the country um, sharing their thoughts about uh, the Alliance and the wars. Um, so I just encourage everybody who's listening tonight to go to uh, a website that's been set up specifically for the inquiry independentpeacefulaustralia.org and you can find out the, all the information you need. But um, going back to our conversation here today, in fact, I think it's probably time, Bianca, for some questions. If you've got some questions there for uh, our, um, our speakers too. We certainly do, yes. Um, so I'm going to fire away with our questions. Thank you everyone so much for sending them through. I'm going to start 
from the top and hopefully we've got um, a fair bit of time. So um, let's try and aim to get through most of them. Um, okay, so first question is, um, so what can we as, or as, an, um, as ordinary citizens do to help free Assange and to make Australia less secret? Um, the second part of that question is, how can we communicate this complicated message to the masses? Hmm. Oh, blimey. Um, <laughs> look, I, I, think there's a, I think there's, a, there's dozens of things people can actually do. And, um, you know, someone said to me years ago, don't go to the pitches, go to a meeting. I mean, frankly, um, uh, political movements and uh, movements around causes uh, are basically just groups of people getting together uh, after, over a glass of wine on a Wednesday night and having a bit of a chat about an issue they're not happy with and working out a few things to do. And those things may range from, um, you know, uh, massive global protests or they may, or may go to a letter writing campaign or, or, or anything in between. And I really recommend that people do that, that they talk to their friends and the common concerns they have, they organise around those concerns by coming together and saying, right, we're having dinner tonight or we're meeting tonight. We're not going to leave until we come up with a plan, a five-point plan of something to do. And, boy, those ideas will pop out. You know, people will know, I know the local member. I, you know, I can do this. I can do that. Pe people can do it. And, really, it, it's our life. It's our government. It's our country. We need to do it because others are doing it for us. So I, I just re recommend that people go to meetings, that people have discussions, and that people make plans. And that they write letters. Um, it, it, it sounds surprising, and I know we're all treated very discourteously, and half the time they don't, or 90% of the time they don't reply. I, I'm old enough to remember when every letter to a minister got a, a reply within 21 days, signed personally by the minister. Now you're very wow. bloody lucky if you get something signed by a junior minder. But the point is, they keep an eye on, on how many people are writing about what. And I've been involved in making representations to ministers, you know, face to face about uh, and, 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 and significant backbenchers and what have you, about war powers reform and about refugees. And the, 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 the answer so many of them use is, oh, look, I understand where you're coming from, mate, but no one ever raises it. So... Yeah. It's not an issue that's on the agenda because no one ever raises it. Doesn't matter whether it's right or wrong, no one ever raises it. So you, if, if, if you care about something, it's worth getting your views on the record. And not a form letter someone else has written. It's better to be a thumbnail dipped in tar expressing it in your own words. So it's obviously come from that individual on their initiative. Uh, the minders can spot a form letter at 100 paces. Uh, yeah. Just write it in your own words and drop it in the letterbox. And not only your, your own local member, but any relevant minister uh, and your state senators. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Th thank you very much, um, Peter and Paul, for that very um, practical um, advice as well. Um, I'm going to move straight on to our next question. Um, so we've got a, um, it has been directed at you, Peter, but I guess um, anyone's, you know, who wants to answer can. Any hope for um, Assange against, uh, under Biden, do you think? No, no, I think there's no chance that Biden will, or very slim chance that Biden would be thinking about providing a, um, a pardon for Assange. Obviously, the requests have gone in and are going in to get him to reconsider the case against uh, the, the extradition and to look at the, the fact of his mental health and, and, and what that involves. But my understanding is that the appeal has already been responded to. So the, the US justice system is grinding along way too fast for this new shiny president to do anything, even if he was inclined to do anything, which, which I really doubt. Um, the hope yeah. remains with an appeal and, and the ongoing public campaigning. Uh, people have come out of the woodwork in support of Assange as, as it's pulled together towards the US election, the inauguration coming. And a, a lot of people have come out of the woodwork. You know, there's an Australian parliamentarians group for, for WikiLeaks and Assange. I mean, there's, there are questions being put. Um, uh, 
asking why is this Australian being treated so badly? And um, um, so, yeah, those two things are, are where it's at. N number one, public pressure, asking the question, pressuring, writing the letters, speaking to the local members, hassling people, um, and, uh, and journalists asking the tough questions because journalists sometimes get a no and move on to the next question. And really they've got to stand their ground and not leave the room until they have proper answers to the questions they've got. Now, recently, um, Anthony Albanese was uh, pressed about the situation of um, uh, Bernard Caleri and Witness K and in Crikey, uh, he, he gave some answers and, and talked about how Labor will support uh, uh, them, their cases being uh, reconsidered. So um, media, public pressure, but the, the appeal um, that will take place. But, you know, the aim is probably to, to silence Julian in the worst way. So I, I fear uh, how long this is going to stretch out and what the result's going to be. So we've got to maintain pressure. And isn't it an incredible thing to think that you've got to pressurise your government to consider human rights of an Australian? Mm -hmm. I mean, mm. where are we at? Where, where, where are we at when, uh, when we have to think, oh, how can we help this Australian who's locked in, in top security in London? Well, we've got a high commission over there who is supposed to go in and help and support Australians. They're too busy helping Australian businesses do deals in, in Europe and in Britain than they are to help, you know, one Australian uh, who's been thrown in the clink. And he's been thrown in the clink because he stood up to empire. And that's, you know, the cardinal sin. Mm. Yeah, this uh, segues really well into the next question um, there for, again, anyone who wants to answer. Um, so um, this person has said, WikiLeaks has done humanity a favour in exposing much underhand behaviour. Given that as accepted, where do we draw the line in terms of breaking into a person's, comp uh, person's companies or country's house, computer, et cetera, um, who is allowed to and who isn't? Oh, um uh, we'll look up. I mean, in terms of intelligence agencies breaking in or journalists breaking in, I'm not sure what you're suggesting, but let's say, first of all, intelligence agencies, oh, if they've got good reason to be to listening in, I mean, breaking in electronically um, or breaking in physically, if they've got good reason, justification, support of a judge where need be approval by the minister, then, and there's proper oversight, then, then of course, um, uh, the welfare of the nation needs to be looked after. Um, and likewise, with, with journalists, no, that, it's not their job to do the break in, breaking in, but it's their job to be prepared and to provide the pathway for whistleblowers who are so concerned that their organisations are not doing the right thing and so fearful of the results of speaking out that they'll destroy their careers, that journalism provides a, a way for those people to complain about what's been happening in their organisations. And journalists are not all stupid. I mean, they, they will actually consider the, the, the leaks and, and the whistleblowing, and, and they will um, uh, assess the viability, you know, the importance of the issue, and, and hopefully, hopefully, uh, um, produce terrific journalism as, as a result. So, uh, no, no, journalists shouldn't be doing breaking in, that's for sure. Um, but they should be providing the secure Dropbox, the encrypted email, all of those methods, even a PO box for a letter in an envelope with a stamp. Um, all, all of those methods that, um, that allow people to communicate uh, with them. And in days gone by, I, could, I can recall, I think uh, it's a little bit hazy now, and I think Gough Whitlam said some pretty... Um, misleading things about uh, what was going on in North, North Vietnam, Hanoi, and that time. And someone, uh, some clearly uh, not very gruntled person in, in foreign affairs just dropped a whole bunch of cables in uh, Laurie Oakes' letterbox in Canberra. Uh, you know, so that, that's, that, that's the way we did it before, before email on WikiLeaks, it was just a, just a whole, <laughs> whole dump of hard copies saying, have a, have a read of this lot. You know, yeah, golf's, not, yeah. golf's not leveling it with us, and 
uh, what what you'll find and what I find over a forty year found of, over a forty year career in uh, public service and related organisations is that uh, uh, you start to get the leaks when uh, you, you start to get a significant divergence between the truth and what the public's being yeah. told. That's what yeah. that's what causes somebody to blow the whistle uh, by whatever means that gets done. Just aware that we've got only a couple of minutes and I'd like to see if we can fit another question in um, just if possible. This was a good one. Um, and again, apologies if we don't get to your question this evening. Um, uh, this person has asked, why do you think um, in, in general, um, we're not more interested? Uh, my friend who is very right wing would dispute what you're saying. What would you say to this person to challenge his beliefs? Um, well, um, well, Read the book. Uh, <laughs> I, I think um, being open to new information is, is the answer to that sort of a problem. And if the person's not prepared to because of their family upbringing or experiences they've had and they're closed to information, then that's another issue and you've got to, you've got to work through that somehow. But I think not necessarily that book. You can go on the web and read similar stuff uh, in, in articles, fish around, on, on even in Wikipedia, and you can find out uh, uh, you know, information that's not generally known, but be prepared to learn. And um, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm just always uh, interested in learning what's going on and understanding better how, how things work. And, um, and new information provides new understanding. And with, with the new understanding, then you can change your views on, on things. And, you know, there's no correct view, there's facts. And, and the more facts you've got, the better off, the better your opinion will be. So I think it's really important to, um, to be prepared to seek information out from outside of your silo, get off Twitter, stop just clicking on your mates, uh, uh, you know, articles and ideas. And as uh, Chris Hedges said uh, a while ago, he's an American uh, journalist, and he, he said, put a barrier between yourself and social media and have a break, read a book, sit down quietly and have a go. It's an astounding thing to do. And I really recommend that if someone's angry and has a, you know, uh, strong views that you think are incorrect, gently point them towards some information that might set them on the right track, some new information. And I mean, just one chapter out of that, that's all, all I need to do. <laughs> I had to say, I had to answer that, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just want to get to more questions, but unfortunately we have run out of time um, and uh, there's some long winded ones there. So I'd be happy to send a copy um, for your interest just um just so our panel has an idea of, um, you know, what, what we're looking at at the moment from an attendee's perspective. Um, and if, if people put their email addresses on, I'm happy to fire through an answer if it's, if it's worthwhile. All right. Is there, um, I guess, yeah, contact-wise and that sort of thing, is there a general way that people can find out more or get in touch or anything like that with... Um, with anyone? Like I think, uh, Annette, you've shared some information in the chat there to everyone. Yeah, that's mostly about the inquiry. So, um, yeah, um, it's there for people to have um, a guide to where to go if you're going to put your thoughts down on just a bit of paper or you can send a letter like uh, Paul was saying. It doesn't need to be a huge contribution, but um, we want to hear from, from all of you on this uh, webinar and, and more. And we're looking for opportunities to talk to people out in the community I did a presentation the other night in the local church, and that's the sort of thing that we're, we're aiming to do over the next six months while the uh, inquiry is open for submissions up until the end of July. Great. All right. Thank you very much for that, um, Annette. And thank you also, um, Paul and Peter, before um, we wrap up for this evening, did you have any sort of um, brief um, last comments or anything like that? Can I just make one more further comment? Sure. It's a pretty, um, uh, pretty substantial, a pretty important uh, week this week. We've got the transition in the US, but on Friday, the, um, the work of ICANN 
is bearing fruit. Uh, mm. On Friday, the Treaty to Prohibit Nuclear Weapons will come into force as a legal instrument. And I think that is an amazing achievement by what started off as a small group of people working from the Medical Association for Prevention of War in Australia to now being a, an international uh, organisation with this fantastic achievement. So that is another thing that each and every one of us can do, put pressure on our government to sign the treaty to prohibit nuclear weapons. Okay. Yep, look, Thank thanks, thanks so much to Avid Reader for putting on, on this um, Brisbane, the official Brisbane Queensland book launch of A Secret Australia. So that's brilliant. Good on you. Thanks very much. And thanks also to Monash uh, University Publishing for having the, um, the interest in, in picking this one up. So, and, and to all the contributors, um, including Paul. Cheers. There's quite a few there. Wonderful. Okay. And um, thank you again, um, Paul, as well, for joining us. Um, Thank you. Um, I'm now going to allow everyone to um, unmute yourselves. Um, so we go. So you should at the moment be able to unmute um, if you want to test that out, and we'll give every, um, give you the opportunity to now join me in a round of applause um, uh, for our guest panel this evening um, in launching a secret Australia in true avid style. Thank you. <laughs> Congratulations to, to the people who bought it. Thank you. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Take care. Have a good evening. Thank you very much. Thanks so okay. much for your com comments and questions, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Bianca. Thanks, Annette. Bye. Bye. See you. Bye.